illustration i'm not a prop guy but we're using props and the the danger of using props is also inviting someone on stage that doesn't know what they're doing so everyone welcome emmanuel to the stage right <laughs> come stand right here come stand right here uh he, he he's he's the unknown part of the prop okay what i've asked is miles if you will very carefully careful 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 all right careful Okay, he's going to hand you this. Okay, he's going to hand you this goo. All right, and um, he, I need you to hold that very, very carefully. It's, don't shake it too much. It, you might. Okay. <laughs> so what, what, I'm, what, what I want to do is I'm going to describe what you have in your hands to you. And then after I describe what you have in your hands, I'm going to ask you three <laughs> questions that you can answer with one word, okay? All right. So um, the first description is of your goo is that it is fierce to you. The second one is that it's burning. If you hold on to it long enough, burning will happen. Uh, blazing. <laughs> Blazing and burning kind of go together, but blazing will also, the burning will eventually erupt. Uh, it's hostile to your health. Um, it is destroying to you. You hold on to it long enough, that's what's going to happen. It boils, right? It's exciting. It boils, right? Uh, it is, un once it gets going, it's unquenchable. There ain't nothing we can do to help you out. Uh, it's bursting and blasting at the same time, which seems rather messy up on stage. Um, it will tear you to pieces. Uh, it is terrifying. Uh, it is consuming. It's smoldering. That happens after the blasting and the bursting and the blazing and the burning and the boiling and the boiling. Uh, it's engulfing and slaughtering to you, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It, it is, it is. I'm not, can, I'm not going to touch that. Can you? Yeah, get that. I don't want to hurt myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> Right. So, so, so now that, so now that, so now that you know uh, the descriptors of that mysterious goo that you have in hand, three quick questions. How do you feel about holding it now? One word. I'm scared. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> number two. Do you think it's helpful for you to hold it? No. Okay. And uh, would you like to keep holding it? No. All right. Everyone, give them a round of applause. That was it. That was the illustration. Manuel did such a good job. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You can go. Yeah, I would wash your hands. It might turn to blazing bowl. If you haven't guessed it yet, uh, if you haven't guessed it yet, that's my son, everybody. Give a round of applause for my son. That's right. <laughs> These are the descriptions of your anger in the Bible. And by the way, these descriptions of your anger in the Bible are not cherry picked. I did not grab the bad ones and leave out the good ones. Guess what? There are no good ones. There are only, there are not positives about your anger in the Bible. What it says it'll do to you, it will burn you. It was hostile to you. It is unquenchable. It'll eventually tear you apart. It's consuming. It'll engulf and it will slaughter you. And yet we have been told, I have been told, I grew up at least believing that anger was a gift from God. I, I, did anybody else believe that righteous anger was a gift from the Lord? In fact, in, in my head, and I couldn't have said this out loud, but I think most of us believe that the fruits of the Spirit include anger, right? You have love, joy, peace, patience, anger, right? But it's not, look it up, it's not there. And just this past week, I got a phone call. Past, pastors get these phone calls because like, it's, it's in me and Bishop's job description. It's just what it is. Is I got a phone call, and the, the person said to me on the other line, he said, we've been going through this anger thing. And um, I'm struggling with it because my family, we, we went through something when I was younger, and I, I found out this atrocious thing was happening in my household. Just utterly and he told me about it and what he told me about that happened in his household is no short of pure evil pure evil was going on in his household and he said to me shouldn't i be angry if i'm not angry am i just supposed to ignore it and this brings up the question of this week which is simply this 
what about injustice? Everyone say that with me. What about injustice? What about abuse? What about racism? What about sexism? What about these wars that shouldn't be going on? What about climate change? What about the other party and the other party's candidate? What about the police brutality? What about, what about, what about, what about, what are, aren't we supposed to do something about injustice? And the answer is what? It's not a trick question. Yeah, I hope we do, right? Yes, but first we need to know how to do it. A couple of things that you need to learn this week. The first one, this is foundational, is simply this. Our job isn't God's job, and God's job isn't our job. Y'all say that with me. Our job isn't God's job, and God's job isn't our job. Listen, here's the deal. Cordell's job is, Cordell's right over here. Cordell's job is not my job, and my job is not Cordell's job. And if we mix those up, you will suffer. That's the way that's going to happen. And let me tell you what, because what, what happened is a couple of months ago, um, every once in a while we had these microphone packs and if you put, it's a little button, it's a little button and it turns on, it turns off. Every once in a while I forget to turn off my little thing. And so I'll be talking to someone and say, hey, Josh, your microphone's on. So what had happened was uh, worship was going on and I was just singing, 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 right? And, uh, and my voice was going out over the interwebs, right? And they were all hearing Cordell's team and me. And Cordell came up to me afterwards. He goes, I, you know, you forgot to turn your mic off. I was like, oh my gosh. He goes, he goes, I listened to it. He goes, you sing so robustly to the Lord. I was like, well, thank you. And he said, and terribly. So if you will please <laughs> turn it, I was like, okay, right? Our jobs are not the same. Actually, so Romans chapter 12 talks about this. It says, it starts here. It says, do not, say, say everything, do not Okay, do not repay anyone evil for what? Okay, so that's not your job. And then it says, be careful to do, everyone say to do. Okay, so this is your job. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, you're supposed to do what? With who? With everybody. Okay, your job, not evil for evil, your job, live at peace with everyone. And then it says again, do not, everyone say do not. Okay, this is not your job. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to what? I will what? Says who? Okay, so revenge, avenge, wrath, not your job. On the contrary, everybody say my job. This is your job. If your enemy is hungry, you're supposed to what? If, you're, if he's thirsty, you're supposed to do what? Give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. And then just to make sure we get it, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What he's saying is if you try to do God's job, you will be overcome by evil. Two quick truths on this. Number one. In order to justify our right to revenge, we have to confuse ourselves with God. When we walk around and we walk around in anger and we say, I'm going to make them pay because they done did me wrong. You are confusing yourself with God. You're trying to take his job. That's not your job. Our job is to what? And who? You're like, I don't know, Josh. I don't know if I'm buying into this yet. <laughs> well, let's go to Jesus for a second. Maybe, maybe you'll buy into Jesus. My hope, this is a Christian church. Because Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Let me say this. You hear this every day on your news station. And I don't care which news station you listen to. You hear it on new, your news station. They say, let's take the other party down no matter what. 
That's what you hear said every day. But Jesus says, but I tell you that if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you're supposed to what? Turn the other cheek. He says, if someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, you're supposed to do what? He says, if anyone tries to force you to go one mile, you're supposed to do what? Go two miles. And in case you're confused, Jesus goes on a little bit. It's a long sermon. He says, but you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's the other message that you hear on your news station every day. And I don't care if it's the left. I don't care if it's the right. Your news station says, love the people that are like you. Hate the people that are not. You are being literally taught to hate every day. But Jesus says, but I tell you, we're supposed to what? And do what? Pray for those who persecute you. Our job is to love and serve our enemies. Our job isn't God's job, and God's job isn't our job. You see, this is where the question comes in. Because the question comes in, we're like, okay, great, I see what you're saying, I understand that, but what about injustice? What about the injustice that I received? What about what happened in my family? What about what my employer did to me? What about the things that I see on TV? What about all the things that we're wrestling with here and globally? Aren't we supposed to do something about it? And the answer is still what? Yes. But anger shouldn't motivate your justice work. What should? Okay. Martin Luther King Jr., um, 1955. Montgomery uh, bus boycotts. Um, during that period of time, one of the many things that happened is the powers that be refused to make settlement, refused to, to come together and land the plane and, and bring peace in the situation, but they blamed it on Martin Luther King. They, go, they defamed him. They went out and said in the newspapers, they said, they said over the radio waves, they said, we would reach a settlement if Dr. King would reach a settlement, but he just won't come to the table, which was a blatant lie. And Dr. King said this in his autobiography. He said, that Monday I went home with a heavy heart. I was weighed down by a terrible sense of guilt. Why did Dr. King feel guilty? He remembered that on two or three occasions, I had allowed myself to what? And what? He said, I'd spoken hastily and resentfully, and yet I knew this was no way to what? Solve a problem. You must not harbor anger, I admonish myself. You must be willing to suffer the anger of the opponent, and yet not what? Return anger. You see, Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Knew He acted, but he didn't act from anger because if he acted from anger, he knew it wouldn't work. Everyone say it wouldn't work, right? Because he knew as a reverend what was in this passage. 1 Corinthians 13 is the famous love passage. We love using this passage in our weddings. And if, it, if you used it in your wedding, super great, right? Not judging you, but it's not talking about romantic love at all. It's talking about the church. And it says this, he goes, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, so if I speak in a heavenly language, but I don't have what? And I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, or I think of nails on a chalkboard. If you speak with love, if you speak without love, good words without love, it sounds like, you know, you're like, oh, stop, make it like, right? He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, I can move mountains with my faith, but I have not love, I'm what? I'm nothing. And then Paul says, if I give all of my possessions, like not some of my possessions, not if I tithe 5%, not if I tithe 10%, not if I give half of my stuff away, if I give literally all of my stuff away and I let them beat me, which they did, by the way, to Paul several times, right? But I don't have love, I what? Here's the thing, Martin Luther King Jr. knew. He knew that if he was an angry, injustice yeller, no one would listen. 
He knew that if he made, if he made himself into an angry injustice fire, like what we know about Dr. King is that he was peaceful and loving and he took upon other people's anger, but he didn't return the anger. But if he was the angry one, he wouldn't be in our books. He wouldn't have a statue in DC. If, if he knew that if he fought injustice and anger, he would gain what? Nothing. Two quick truths. Number one, the Bible commands us to act. Stop right there. Y'all say that with me. The Bible commands us to act. We should be fighting injustice, but it never says to do it out of anger. It never says to do it out of anger. A couple of stories in the Bible. Number one, you remember that, that time when Jesus turned tables over? Everyone knows, like Jesus is flipping tables over in the temple, right? Um, everyone thinks this became, it's because he, he became angry. Look it up. Has nothing to do with anger. It says because he had zeal for the Lord and he loved, he started flipping tables. Esther, in the book of Esther, risked her life, did a lot of political savvy moves that, where, where she moved in and out of different political arenas to achieve the ultimate goal of bringing justice to a group that was not getting justice. And in all the time, you can look it up, it says she did it out of love. Her enemies, though, if you read the book of Esther, Haman and the king acted out of anger every time they acted out of anger. Esther only acted out of love. And Paul, when Paul confronted Peter, Paul confronted Peter and he got all up, it says, it says, I got up into his face. He got all up in his grill because Peter was being a racist. And he said, Peter, you're being a racist. And for the love of Jesus Christ, you've got to stop. But it says he did it all out of love. You see, the Bible commands us to act against injustice, but never ever does it say it should come out of anger. Another Christian pastor, one that we've heard of a little bit less, says this, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, Jesus will not accept the common distinction between righteous anger and unjustifiable anger, which is the premise of this whole series. There is no such thing as righteous anger. We think there is, but there's not. Jesus rejects all of it. He says the disciple must be entirely innocent of anger because anger is an offense against both who and who? His neighbor. Here's the deal. When you read that, you, you probably think to yourself, this pastor that's telling me never to be angry, he seems like some pie in the sky, ivory tower theologian that never gets out, that just pushes his glasses up like this and writes stuff to us. No, no, no. D Dietrich Bonhoeffer tried to kill Hitler. Like, I mean, you know, that's, yeah, yeah, right? Plot to get failed, got caught, got jailed, and got hanged for it. And like, whether you, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, you can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing later. But what he's saying is, I tried to bring justice out of love to save millions of people. That's truth number one. And here's truth number two. And I believe truth number two is the truth that many of us need and many of us are confused. And so if you, if you walk away today with just one thing, maybe it's truth number two, and that's this. Anger and action are not the same thing. Can y'all say that with me? Anger and action are not the same thing. We confuse these two. We think that if I'm not angry, I'm accepting the injustice that they're sending my way. If I'm not angry, I'm not doing anything. Here's the thing, they're not the same thing. Have y'all heard of a thing called slacktivism? Everyone say slacktivism, right? Uh, you haven't probably heard of that technical term, but you've seen it. What slacktivism is, is it's slacking and activism put together. What is slacking and activism put together? This is what it looks like. I've seen it most on Twitter or on X. I can't get used to that, on X, right? Uh, but it's, it, it's on the Facebooks and it's on the Instagrams and the TikToks and all that kind of stuff. Here's what it is. Someone sees a social justice issue, either one that they are for or one that they're against. And they say, I am a social justice warrior. I'm going to do my part. And they click thumbs up or they click thumbs down 
And then they pat themselves on the back and they walk away, right? Here's, here's, right? It's like, I'm fighting injustice. Click, 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 click. I'm so angry. Click, 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 click. Here's what's interesting. Actual studies have shown, and I know I'm stepping on some of your toes right now. That's okay. That's what pastors do. You pay me to do this. Here's the deal. Actual studies have shown, several different universities have shown. Here's what's interesting. The more likely a person is to click, 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 click on the internet, the less likely they are to actually do anything about said issue. So for example, the more likely you are to click, help the poor people of wherever feed the starving children, statistically, you are a lot less likely to actually help the poor starving children of wherever because the dopamine gets sent to your brain, the dopamine gets sent to your brain, and your brain tells you, you did all you need to do, good job you, go buy some pizza, right? That's what it's, right? That's your brain tells you to do, right? That's not acting, that's just being angry. Angry and action are not the same thing. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Reverend Bonhoeffer acted. He tried to end World War II, but he did it out of love. Reverend King acted. He helped end segregation. He did it out of love. Jesus of Nazareth acted. He ended death. He defeated the devil for you, but without anger. Anger and action are not the same thing. And here's the deal. Acting out of anger isn't a sign that you trust in God's plan. It's a sign that you think it's all up to you. Y'all remember when um, Peter was in the garden, he was just cutting off. I love the fact that like over the past three weeks, I've always done the cut. Peter's just cutting off people's ears, you know, like just whacking them. Whack, 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 right. But you know, Peter's in the garden and Peter, you know, Jesus is getting arrested and Peter looks at Jesus and he's like, he's not doing anything. Somebody's got to do something. And so, so in anger, he starts slicing ears, right? Or are James and John, like, you know, uh, uh, Jesus wants to stay at the Holiday Inn there in the Samaritan village and the Holiday Inn's like there's no room in the inn again right and Jesus is like okay well I guess I'll go to the next town and James or John's like well Jesus isn't doing anything so let's burn the whole city down right let me ask you a question over the past week over the past month how many times have you looked at your life and said, Jesus isn't doing anything about it, and I'm angry. I guess I must step in. It's not what he tells us to do. He tells us to do something different. He tells us to wait. Everyone say wait. It says this. Psalm 37 says, um, evildoers, they'll be cut off. But those who what? But on the Lord, they'll, they're the ones that will inherit the earth. Uh, uh, later on in the same psalm, he tells us to what? Wait on the Lord. That's your job. And he says to keep his way. That's your job. And he, his job, will exalt you to inherit the earth, and he'll take care of your enemies. His job, exalting you, taking care of your enemies. Your job, waiting and obeying. Says it again in the Proverbs. He says, don't say, I'm going to get evil for this wrong. We're supposed to do what? To do what? To handle the matter. Let's go back to Dr. King, Reverend King for a second. In his most famous speech, I have a dream. He says, I have a dream that one day, ever say one day, he says, I have a dream that one day that America will live out being created equal. He says, I have a dream that one day, say one day, that, 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 that my African-American little children will play with those little white children. Those white little children will play with my African-American children. He says, I believe that one day, everyone say one day, he said that the freedom that we're promised will ring out. He says, I have a dream that one day, say one day. I, that, that, that we will not be judged by the content of our, uh, but we, we will be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. Here's what Dr. King did. He loved, he acted, and he waited. He loved, he acted, and he waited. He loved, he acted, and he waited. But that begs the question, 
where do you and I get the power to do the same thing? And the answer is simply this. You and I, we can react to injustice with love because Jesus reacted to what? How? Think about this. In the garden, we're back in the garden, right? And Jesus is getting arrested, right? You know, Peter, Peter, Judas turned on Jesus. The guards are circling around, starting to put the handcuffs on Jesus. And Peter boils up in anger and says, they're not, they're, Jesus isn't doing anything. And I, this is injustice. This is injustice. And so he, acting out of anger, starts cutting off ears. And he says, vengeance is mine, says Peter. I will avenge, says Peter. I will do something about injustice and anger, says Peter. Because he thinks that's the thing to do. But later that night, everyone say later that night. Later that night, Peter did the same thing. Peter turned on Jesus three times. I don't know that man. I don't know that man. I don't know that man. And then the rooster crowed. And the question is, is Jesus going to treat Peter like Peter treated them? But what does he do? He makes Peter breakfast. Hey, ham and eggs. Not ham. This is Jewish thing. You, you, get, you get what I'm saying, right? Sausage biscuit. Uh. I know that was the joke, Julie. It was, a, it was a double sausage thing. So, okay. Halibut and bread. Is that better? Does that make you feel better about yourself? Okay. He made him breakfast. And he forgave him three times. And he set him on mission and said, hey, I know you just in, did injustice to me, but here's what I want you to do. Go feed my sheep. This is what Jesus does with you and me. Because you, and I'm just speaking the truth for you, even if you can't speak the truth for yourself, you and I turn on Jesus daily. Daily, not weekly, not monthly, you and I turn on Jesus daily. We see his instructions about all the things. We're like, oh, Jesus says to do that with my money? Nope, not doing that. Jesus says to do that with my sexuality? Nope, I'm not going to do that. Jesus says to do it, like, just, you know, put it whatever in. Jesus says to do that about anger? Nope, not doing that, right? And then, right, and what we have is it's not just because, because it's between us and and the one Alpha and Omega God, this is not small injustice. What you do, what we do is cosmic injustice. Cosmic injustice. And what did Jesus do with our injustice? Here's the answer. Romans 5, 8. But God what? That means he acted. God acted. God demonstrates his own what? Love. He acted out of love, not out of anger. He acted out of love for us in this while we were still what? That's injustice, cosmic injustice. We did cosmic injustice. But out of love, he acted and Christ did what? Died for us. He said, I see what they did. It's not this big. It's not this big. It's not this big. What we have done against God is this big. But he looked at us with love and he acted and he resolved the injustice and the entire world got changed. As we stand to our